Leander Paez is a superstar in the world of doubles tennis. He's one of just three players in the Open era to win career Grand Slams in men's and mixed doubles. But you may not know that his only Olympic medal so far came in singles at Atlanta 1996. We're going to be joined by the great man himself to go through his bronze medal match against Fernando Melingeni. And here he is. I'm delighted to say, Leander, live from Mumbai. Great to have you with us, buddy. How are you doing? Namaste, Rory. It's a real uh, treat to be on the uh, Olympic Channel live with you today. Fantastic. It's great, great for you, for you to join us. Let's go back in time 24 years now to Atlanta. Um, analog TV, long time ago. Um, your second <laughs> Olympic Games. And just set the scene for us. You've played a few matches to get to this point, the bronze medal match. You lost in the semi-finals to the top seed, Andre Agassi, who, who went on to win gold. And I, I'm going to say this now. I love serve volley tennis, so I love the way you play the game. You play the game. And Andre Agassi, one of the best baseliners that's ever lived, but you managed to trade with him from the baseline. It was a really good match. First set went to a tie break. Could have gone either way. That's exactly right, Rory. Uh, well, all of us have a story. And my story started with my father. Uh, my father had a dream in 1972 when he won his uh, Olympic medal in Munich that his first son must be an Olympic champion. I was conceived at the Munich Olympics. Uh, and then I was born on June 17, 1972. And uh, at that, um, my father honed my skills as a young athlete growing up in India. And back then, tennis in India didn't have quite uh, the infrastructure. But really, as I developed, I, I left home at the age of 12. And my sole purpose was to emulate my father and have my own Olympic medal. So coming into Atlanta, I had already played in Barcelona in my first Olympics. And I came a sliver shy of winning a medal in doubles with Ramesh Krishnan. We lost in the quarterfinals to Goran Ivanizovic and Goran Pirpic in four tough sets. And if you remember, Rory, back uh, in 92 in, in Barcelona, there was a gold medal given, a, br a silver medal given, and two bronze medals. Whereas in Atlanta, as you're going to see here, um, we had to have a playoff for the bronze medal. And in that playoff, I played uh, one of my best friends, Fernando Melingeni from Brazil. But just before that, I had lost to another good mate of mine, Andre Agassi. Yes, and we're just seeing it now. This is the third and final set. And I think your loved one down, you're serving. Lovely bit of serve volley to start off the game. But I think, not giving too much away here, I am a little bit, you're going to find yourself in a bit of a spot here. <laughs> I actually found myself in a bit of a spot when I saw the draw this Saturday before this match. Of course, I drew yes. a peak tempers. And uh, a lot of my mates who had known that I had prepared for three and a half years for Stone Mountain, uh, we were playing up in altitude at, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia at Stone Mountain. And I had gone off to Belo Horizonte in Brazil. I had gone to Medellin, Colombia, Bogota, Quito. And I played in all these altitude places, Rory, to prepare my body and my lungs and my serve and volley tennis to peak at, uh, at the Olympics in Atlanta. And all that hard work uh, really kind of scared me in the face when I saw the draw. Uh, to play Pete Sampras, but a little bit of uh, history. Um, I'm a big believer in karma, and uh, it's amazing how life pans out. But Pete Sampras uh, withdrew from the Olympics and didn't play. And uh, as much as they replaced him with Richard Renneberg, coming into this bronze medal match, I had to beat a lot of really good uh, singles players. I beat Richard Renneberg in the first round. I had beaten um, one of my best friends, uh, Nicolas Pereira, uh, in the second round. Then I beat uh, Thomas Inquist who was number one in the world in the juniors the year after I was. Uh, and then I beat Renzo Furlan. And then I lost to one of my best friends, uh, Andre Agassi, in the semifinal. But if you look at my right wrist here, which is literally just sitting on my, on my, on my lap right there with the wristband around it, notice how thick that wristband is, Rory. Andre Agassi had uh, ruptured a few tendons in the semifinal between my wrist and my elbow. Um, I had Andre down 5, 6, 15, 40 in the first set. And uh, I hit an approach shot down the line to his backhand, and I came to the net. And Rory, I thought I had everything covered. I had it down the line covered. I had the forehand smash covered. I had the backhand smash covered. And if he was going to go with the short angle, which is the low percentage, I had the dive covered. 
But Andre, as brilliant as he is, as, as not only a human being, but a phenomenal competitor, he hit the one shot I wasn't prepared for, and that was right at my face. And uh, I tried to fend that off into the open court, and I ran tendons in my wrist. So that's why you see, uh, I lost to Agassi that day in, in two sets comfortably after that, because I couldn't really grip my racket. I lost all the power and all the feeling in my fingers and in my wrist. So if you see here in this match, I'm trying to keep the rallies as short as possible. I'm chipping and charging. I'm getting to the net because uh, Fernando Melanzini is a south pole. He's a baseliner, and he's got a very unorthodox uh, uh, baseline game. And he tries to keep you out there running side to side. So for me, I was trying to play quick points. Even there, I lost the point, but I was just trying to play quick points. Absolutely. Yeah, you just, as you said, he's a left-hander. And uh, one thing I've noticed just already from talking to you, it's like, you, you sound like you're friends with everyone on tour. <laughs> so, and um, I, I, actually, blessed, I, I, I thought back, to, I thought back a couple of years ago, you were in, at Radek Stefanek's um, farewell in Prague, and you were playing doubles with Stefanek, who was, you, you were a great partnership, and you were up against Novak Djokovic and Tommy Haas. And uh, Thomas Burdich was umpiring. Um, Agassi was um, on the sideline, he was courtside. And um, and he played a couple of points, and uh, it just like you had so much fun. Have you? Fun's been a big part of your career, I'd say. Would you agree? I think it's the way I live my life. You know, the Olympic movement is not just about uh, winning Olympic medals. It's not just about being a champion in 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 getting trophies. But the Olympic movement is about a spirit. It is about a movement of health, happiness, uh, making a difference to the community. And I think that uh, coming from a country like India, I, I was born to two amazing parents who were both champions in their own right, Rory. My mom, Captain India in basketball, all, all five foot nothing of her. She had a great three-point shot and she was really quick. Um, my father was the workhorse. He was 63. He was the center half of the national team. He won a medal in 72 in Munich, as I said. But he was the real workhorse. So growing up to these two parents, I realized that the Olympic movement and the vehicle I have as tennis could move my community. And I try and do that with happiness. I try and do that with love. I try and do that with leading by example. So as much as uh, we all know in professional sports, sometimes just like this on your screen, you have to go and play one of your best friends across the net. And both of you are competing only for one medal. There's no fourth medal given here. There's only one medal and you're both competing for it. And sometimes you've got to go after your opponent as hard as you can and not give him an inch. But yet, as soon as that last ball bounces twice and the match is over, you hug each other, you go and have a drink together or have some tea together, or you go watch a movie with some popcorn and you're friends again. But that's the beauty of uh, professional sport, Rory, I think, is you compete hard and at the same time, you, you also make some great friends around the world. So you quickly forgave Andre Agassi for rupturing your wrist tendons. <laughs> you, you didn't, no hard feelings there. <laughs> Well, there was no hard feeling for rupturing my wrist, but uh, I'll never forgive him for uh, what he wrote about me in open in his book. <laughs> Just a little tongue-in-cheek. But he said, uh, and then in the semifinals, he said, I played at Leander Page, and he chopped and he hacked at every single ball. He could not hit one tennis shot clean. But after an hour of playing, you look up at the scoreboard and you're still losing. <laughs> I knew he had a good backhand, but in his vocabulary, that's the best backhand compliment that I've ever had. <laughs> That's great. So just going back to the match, you've saved a break point, I think with an ace, which is um, pretty well done. And uh, now we're back on Melingeli's serve. Um, this match, so you've got that injury and you mentioned you're, you're trying to keep the point short. But how hard, how hard was it playing with that injury? I mean, was it every point you could feel it? You know, after I finished uh, playing Andre Agassi, uh, Dougie Spreen, who was the uh, Olympic physio at the time and the doctors, and my father, who's a doctor of medicine as well, took me to the hospital and got an MRI. And there was a 70% rupture from the wrist to the elbow. And it took me into a hard cut for 24 hours because there was a day break, uh, Rory, between the semifinal match and the bronze medal match. And uh, when I came back on the morning of playing Melanjini here, I went out to warm up in the morning and uh, they cut the cast off. They strapped my wrist up very heavily. 
And when I got out there to uh, to warm up, I could not even touch the ball. And if you can see here, I'm trying to get myself rattled up. I'm trying to get the adrenaline pumping because you get thrown in a free situation like this. It's all about the mental attitude. It's all about the mental toughness. Um, sometimes winning matches is not about the repertoire of your forehands or backhands or the quality of your serves and backhands. Sometimes it's all about heart. Sometimes it's all about passion. And if you can see, I'm trying to take as many shots as I can on my forehand side because I did not have any power on my backhand. And uh, right here, you see, I've just broken Melanjeni for a quick break in the uh, in the third set to go up. I think it is 2-1 if I'm not mistaken. Actually, right. I know it's 2-1. I don't I don't forget any points of my career. <laughs> but <laughs> but really, uh, coming into it, it is 2-1. That was lucky. But uh, coming into it, uh, I knew now that I had to play quick tennis. I did not want to give Melin Jenny any time to recuperate, to get his thoughts together again. I did not want to give him any time. As you see, he's trying to gather himself. He's down. He won the first set. He had break points in the second set. I saved them. And then he had break points in, in the second game of the third set. I managed to save that as well. And right now, you can see I've got him in a, spit of, in a bit of bother. It was hot. It was humid out there. Um, we've both got our Olympic caps on to keep the sun out of, out of our eyes. But right now, I'm in the zone. Right now, I'm in a tunnel vision. If you can see, I'm not looking around at the, at the, at the crowd. I'm not looking at my parents who were sitting at a 45-degree angle to my right. I'm all engrossed in what I got to do to covet India's first Olympic medal since 19, I think it was 52 or something like that. Um, it's the first Olymp individual Olympic medal for uh, 44 years. So I was fully engrossed in this. Uh, I knew I was in the driver's seat. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm just controlling the rhythm of the match. There, Melanjen is ready. I'm taking my time. When he's not ready, I'm ready to play. It's all about rhythm sometimes. And uh, I'm in the driver's seat here. I'm probably going to serve and volley, I reckon. <laughs> but uh, I've missed Good my chance first of serve. That, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to serve and volley again on my second serve. You see how weak my serve is, 156 uh, clicks an hour. I'm not serving very big because I can't. My wrist is really sore. I, I don't have much power. You see there, I've just hit a lob up because I don't have uh, power. Also, that backhand was completely un uncontrolled because I, not only did I didn't have power on the wrist, but I didn't have much direction on the backhand. It was just dropped. Every time the ball would hit my racket with the power from Melanjeni, my wrist would just collapse. So I was trying to take everything at the net. I was trying to come in, serve and volley. Uh, I've lost two quick points here by trying to play yeah. fast. I've lost two quick points. And you see, Melanjeni is still perturbed. He's still trying to get himself going. He knows he has to get the break back. I'm sure I take my time on this point. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you do, because he's in the zone now, isn't he? So you've got to try and get him exactly out right. of that rhythm. Yep, that's exactly right. And, Lovely uh, you bit can of serve see, and volley there. Thank you, sir. I've just flipped the rhythm a little bit. You can see all the strapping on that wrist. Uh, the wrist was really swollen up. And uh, I've won that point, so hence I'm letting him think about it. I'm still down 15.30 uh, in the game, but I'm letting him think about it. I've just won the point. I'm like, I'm coming at you. You know I'm going to serve and volley. What are you going to do on your return? Oh, big serve down the middle. That's very hard to deal with. And uh, easy put away. So you've got yourself out of the spot. Love 30, 30 Not all. yet. Not yet. I'm still Not 30 yet. all. Uh, if, I rem if I remember it correct, uh, he hits a pretty good return on this one. But uh, it's 2 1, 30 all. Still playing in my rhythm. Melon Jenny is ready. I'm taking my time. I think sometimes when you look at uh, the margins of achieving an Olympic medal and not winning an Olympic medal, the margins are so small. And I know he played a good return there right at my body, and I knew I missed that forehand uh, volley long. Uh, so I'm down a break point again here. And you see, I've gone to the towel. I've taken my time. And coming back to those margins, Rory, I mean, I've known so many athletes and so many uh, amazing champions who, on the day, I mean, if you look at a 100-meter race at the Olympic final, you prepare for four years, Rory, for nine seconds. And the amount of effort and hard work that goes into an Olympic champion winning a medal or an Olympic champion right here serving upper break 2-1 in the third set in the bronze medal match but finding himself break point down, second serve. And he knows his wrists in trouble. There's a lot of pressure. 
there's a lot of pressure when you're playing for 1.3 billion Indians uh, around the world. And uh, when you see there's here, the I was up a break and he's broken me back. So now what do you do? Now do you just sit back and you make excuses? Now do you sit back and you say, okay, he's played well, well done? No, you don't. You don't have time for that. In the world of professional sport, you don't get many opportunities. And when that one opportunity comes knocking, you don't just open the door, you break that door down. And you're going to see for the next 18 minutes of this match, you're going to see some serious aggressive tennis. You're going to see, I was up a break. I lost the break. Uh, I came back from losing the first set, Rory. I won the second set. I mind over matter right here. I'm concentrating on my racket strings, but my concentration is in my head. Do not get down. Your, your wrist is hurt. You cannot control your backhands. But find a way, Lee. Just find a way to battle through this. And this whole match was very up and down. This whole match, the rhythm of the match was up and down because playing a southpaw is already difficult. Now, playing a baseliner when you're injured is already difficult. But like I said earlier, as much as the margins are so small, sometimes it's mind over matter. Sometimes it's heart above just technique. You may not have the biggest serve in the world. You may not be six foot three or six foot five like the modern tennis players are. But when you're playing for a billion people and when you're playing to emulate your father, whose medal that you've actually polished every Sunday morning after church, and you want to covet your own medal, you really want to not just have that participation medal, you want to win your Olympic medal, I think sometimes you find a little reserve deep down inside of you. Sometimes you find a little courage inside of you. Sometimes you use the wind and the energy of one billion people as wind within your wings and you fly. So right now, again, I'm staring down the barrel. Um, Melon Jenny's back in rhythm again. He's broken my serve. He's probably going to hold serve here. And he's won, a, he's won about the last six points in a row. From 2-1-30 all, he broke my serve with a good return and, and, and I missed a, a volley. And then he's won four points in a row here. Uh, so, so things are not looking good for me at the moment in this match. But uh, it's about just controlling the mind. It's about controlling your breath. It's about going out there and realizing that this is your opportunity in life. I, I didn't know that I would play seven Olympics at this point. I didn't know that I'd be preparing for my eighth Olympics at this point. And most people would have thought with my doubles career with 18 doubles Grand Slams that I would cover, covet a medal in doubles. They wouldn't think I would do one in singles. But this was my moment, Rory. This is when I had to dig deep. Did you, you mentioned being conceived during the Munich Games. Uh, you mentioned polishing your, your father's bronze medal. Did you almost feel like this was destiny for you? Even on the court, did you feel like, you know, even, even though you're down here, you know, 3-2, OK, he's going with serve. But as you say, Melin Jenny's just won the six straight points. Did you kind of feel, no, this is that fate is here or, or some sort of force means that I'm going to come through this. I'm an Olympic athlete. <laughs> Everything I've done in my life is to be an Olympic athlete. I uh, honor my parents. I honor my country because I've played seven Olympics. And this is the torch from Beijing. I brought this little something out for you. This is the torch that actually went around the world and then eventually lit the Olympic flame in Beijing. For me, I think uh, I prided myself on being a good son. I prided myself on being a good father as a single parent to my daughter, who now is trying to be an Olympic athlete herself. But regardless of the 18 Grand Slams I've won, Rory, I'm an Olympic athlete. I got to play in the Olympics seven times, and I have the world record today of playing seven Olympics in tennis for India. And this match right now that you're watching epitomizes my career because the Olympic movement is magical. The Olympic movement is really, really special. Not many people can say they're professional athletes. Only 1% of us professional athletes can probably say we're Olympic champions. Uh, the margins are very slim. And right now in this match, look at Melin Jenny, he's fired up. He really wants to beat me. He really wants to go with the best of friends. I've got uh, uh, a moment right here that I'm staring at where Melin Jenny is in complete rhythm. He's up 3-2 in the third set. Um, I'm serving at 30-15. I'm hitting a second serve. He knows I'm injured. I know I'm injured. Both our boxes, our coaches, our trainers, our, our physios, our families knows that my wrist is sore. My wrist is, has no power for backhands. I'm serving and bowling every chance I can get. 
even that backhand volley was not as sharp as it normally was. That backhand volley on a good day would be a put away. But right there, I can't really hit it away. So I'm trying to hustle him with my speed. I'm trying to hustle him with my mental uh, strategy. But I'm trying to use my God-given talents here to go back to that dream that my father had. Yes, I was conceived in Munich. Yes, the games in Munich were shut down for four days uh, because of an unfortunate incident between Palestinian and Israeli athletes. Um, in those four days that the, the games were shut down, I was conceived. Um, yes, I believe in karma. Um, and when my father uh, got me to understand while I was polishing those medals as a seven-year-old boy or an eight-year-old boy in Calcutta, sitting on the floor with a dirty rag in my hand, just polishing my dad's medal, and I'd ask him, what is this? You know, this angel here, and he goes, that's the Greek goddess Athena. She stands for what the Olympic movement is. And when I asked him about the ribbon around the medal, and he explained all of that to me, I wanted my medal. I wanted my own medal. And my dad would joke with me, Rory. He would sit back and say, you know, the day you get your own medal, you can sit at the dining table and eat with me. <laughs> well, today I can. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You've earned your place at the dining table. You see here on return there, that's a lovely return for a winner. Um, I think that's made it 15 all. But we're getting into the business end now. That wrist is still sore. Bronze medal at stake. What's, what's going through your mind right now? Are you just thinking, if I can get a break here, I can close this out maybe? So you just saw me there on that last point. I pointed at my father because my father actually... Uh screamed out to me from the corner and he just said one word and he goes focus that level of focus is what it takes to be a champion in any walk of life in anything you want to do i'm a young kid from calcutta i didn't have much infrastructure i didn't have one hard court through the whole 80s uh, the analog ages our wonderful uh, <laughs> producer marco and you uh, teased me on you know and uh, when you actually look at you know, growing up in India with not that much facilities in the 80s for tennis, not that much knowledge about physical fitness and mental toughness. And, and, uh, and most Indians do not like a, a physical battle. Most Indians are, are, are not used to that physical battle. You know, we're more inclined uh, in our cerebral business academic uh, brain. But when, it look, when you come to that contact sport, when you come to that physical battle, um, I had to persevere. I had to learn what being a, a professional athlete was about. I had to learn what mental toughness is about. I had to learn what handling adversity was about. And as you can see, uh, I've just upped my level here because all my dad did was just, you know, help me out and just say focus. And uh, if you look at the difference in, in demeanor from Mel and Jenny's body language and the difference in demeanor in my language, um, you would not tell who's the injured one here. You would not tell as to who uh, is feeling great or not feeling great right now. Um, as you can see, I'm leaning outside into the double valley because I want to take everything on my forehand. And all of us knew that. And uh, this point is a huge point in the context of this match. Wow. You see that? Great reaction. Great reaction. So that's my uh, Davis Cup captain. That's my sister, Maria. Uh, you warned me, Rory. You're not going to get me emotional here. It's a hard one. <laughs> Oh, I don't you know. Me, uh... I, I can see you, the way you were talking about the Olympic Games and you can see how much it all means to you. Um, you were talking about the lack of facilities in the 80s when you were young, but despite that, you still managed to get, you still managed to win junior Wimbledon and, and become the number one junior in the world. So does, when you look back, do you just think, wow, that, that was a hell of an achievement to do that that early in your career? And, and then, of course, winning this bronze medal. You, you know, as you say, India not really set up infrastructure-wise for tennis, but you've, you've succeeded. You just see here uh, the physical effort that goes into that point right there. My backhand was fairly weak, but as you see here, I'm mentally just asserting my presence on this match. I uh, was looking at my box. My dad was there, my mom was there, my sister Maria, you saw. Uh, my, my Davis Cup and Olympic captain, uh, Jedi Mukherjee, was there at the time. And I was just asserting my mental presence on this match right here. Um, you'll hear the Indians in the crowd uh, screaming our Indian chants and, and getting us going. And um, you, you could hear the, the Brazilian samba drums 
going out there. But for me, it was one big wave of energy. It didn't matter it had, if it had Portuguese or, or Hindi uh, Sanskrit rhythm to it. It had a rhythm. And for me, sometimes you've got to use that rhythm for your benefit. I'm up a break. I'm up 4-3, but I've still got a lot of work to do. As you know, I was up 2-1 in the, a break in this set. And I played two silly points on my serve to lose that service game for 2-all. And then Melanjani held 3-2. But right now, you see, I'm starting to get my first serves in. I've taken a little pace off my serve because anyway, my wrist is not allowing me to serve at full speed. 157 kilometers an hour. That's not very fast right now. Um, today, the guys are serving way above 200 clicks an hour, you know? And uh, I'm just trying to battle this wrist injury. But as you asked just there, uh, Rory, I think that uh, sometimes when you actually look at uh, an upbringing and you look at the environment of nurturing an Olympic champion, both Melanjani and myself come from Brazil and India. And both those countries are either known, for, Brazil's known for football and India's known for cricket and hockey. So when you look at both of us young kids out there, on an Olympic stage in Stone Mountain, in Atlanta, Georgia, playing at the Atlanta 1996 Olympics, neither of us had any business playing for that bronze medal match. And people will tell you, ah, Leander's a double specialist. Leander won 18 Grand Slams in doubles, not so much in single. They won't talk about the fact that I beat Pete Sampras in 98 in, in New Haven in single, when he was number one in the world. They won't talk about the Hall of Fame championships that I've won in singles in Newport, Rhode Island, one of my favorite tournaments. But this Olympic medal defined Mel and Jenny and myself. This Olympic medal, when I woke up that morning with the wrist injury and the wrist swollen up, I knew that I, my career was going to be defined by what happened that afternoon. And it was all about focus. It was all about mind over matter. It wasn't the best quality tennis. Uh, if you really look at um, shot making and baseline rallies and things. But I wanted to make this match a dogfight. I wanted to make this match about physical and mental aptitude because I knew technically my wrist was not going to allow me to, to battle that hard. So if you see here, I've played four first serves. I've played four first volleys, but as Melanjani knows with the wrist injury, he slipped the lob over my backhand side. Yeah. And as much as I used my shoulder to get power on that, it was a pretty good pop, but I had no control of the wrist. It was just the ball was flying anywhere that day. The amount of backhands I missed that day because I just didn't have control of the direction of my wrist put me in a lot of trouble. That was a big point. That would have given me a 5-3 lead, but I missed it. I couldn't control it. And it was fairly comfortable backhand smash. And now again, I'm down break point. I, uh, I'm actually feeling the nerves. It's not my strings on my racket that I've gone to. I've gone to change my racket, but I was really feeling the nerves. The, I knew the moment was right here. So I'm just taking a, a minute to breathe. I'm taking a minute to gather my head. Um, I'm taking the minute to get my, my thoughts out of my wrist. And uh, as you can see here, I pull the balls out. I'm rotating the balls. I've taken the faster one because it's altitude. It's fast playing surfaces back in 96. The playing surfaces were much faster than you have in 2020. Kind of pays off there's sometimes, nice. doesn't it? <laughs> and there's the ice. Gets you out of jail. There's a little method to the madness, Rory. There's a little <laughs> method to the madness. It's not just all luck. <laughs> You're talking and about, again, obviously, I'm... sorry, go on, go on, Leander, carry on. No, there's my mom. You can see she's nervous. She's got some gum in her mouth, just chewing away. Uh, she is uh, a captain of the Indian national basketball team. She was in the 80s. And my mental toughness I actually got from my mom. And uh, once again, Mel and Jenny did a great job getting to my drop shot that I hit. And he flipped uh, a lob over my backhand side again. And because I had missed, uh, see, I played a semi-short ball, you see, and he's played a great topspin lob. And because I had missed the previous backhand smash, I tried to take it on my forehand side. This time, and I was so awkward out of position, I missed it. But right here, I, I, I don't know if you noticed that, that energy right there. I don't know if you saw my eyes right there, Rory. Something happened to me right here. I'm not sure what it was. But something happened where I somehow questioned myself on whether I was going to lose this break point or not. And something gave me the belief right there at that moment, Rory, that no, I was going to win it. And if you see, I played a tough backhand volley. Melanjeni's rifled the backhand at my forehand side. I fended it off. And when this lob went over my head, trust me, this was really, really close. And I could play it. I could play it. But 
something told me, let it go. Something told me that the gods were smiling on me. If you notice here, it's supposed to be a very nervous situation, but look how relaxed I am. Look how peaceful I am. Something told me at that moment when I got down that second break point in this game that I was going to win this. And something told me, stop thinking, clear your mind, stay in the moment. As the great Bruce Lee said, you know, be like water, my friend, be like water. What does that mean? That means just flow, go with the flow. If you're in a cup, take the shape of the cup. If you're in a stadium like this, feel the energy of the stadium and flow with it. Do you remember how many times I said that my back end was going ori and haywire because of my wrist? That was a really comfortable back end for Mel and Jenny. Where did it go? Yeah, went wide. He completely mistimed it. He completely mistimed it. He was trying to go cross court, which is in that direction, and the ball ricocheted in the other. It was nerves. It was karma. Something is going on right now. Something that's in, 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 inexplainable. It's unexplainable sometimes how under pressure or when on you're on the biggest stages, you just have to control yourself. You just have to take control of your own actions and let the rest play itself out. Um, I believe, uh, you know, as much as we write our history in the history books, I sometimes believe that uh, being a believer of karma, that the history books are already written out and you just have to play them out, you know? And uh, see, coming, coming back from two break points down in this game, um, you know, the, the crowd support, the amount of Indians and Brazilians in that stadium was just magical. It was really loud. And the actual stands, if you look at the stands, there were all these metal seats. And the metal seats and the bowl that we were in, the crowd and the samba beat and the Indian toll, you know, the drums, the Indian drums, were just vibrating so loud that uh, sometimes it was very deafening. And, uh, you know, I tried to focus. I tried to, you know, get back to my power, get back to my racket and stay within my head, you know. Just keep it simple, Philly. It was really my thought here. So now, yeah, Melly Jenny, to this. <laughs> serving to stay in, in the match. You've talked about, see, your mum giving you that mental side. And so how, so having that upbringing, obviously two sporting parents, how did you get into tennis? I mean, you discussed tennis before you came around, not particularly popular. How did, you know, you could have got into, you could have followed your dad into hockey, you could have maybe gone into cricket like most Indians, but you chose tennis. Why was that? That's a great question, Rory. Um, really, I grew up a footballer. Um, I do not believe I'm a talented tennis player, and I'll give you a reason why, as Mel and Jenny holds this game fairly comfortably. But I felt that in tennis, the average height of a tennis player back in the 80s was six feet one. The average height of a tennis player today is six feet four, six feet five. I'm 5'10 on a good day. There's no way that my serve was going to be the most potent or powerful serve in the world. Secondly, is I picked up tennis when I was a 12 year old, really late. And the technique that I have on my backhand or the lack of technique I have on my backhand, um, where most great tennis players, or Roger Federer, single-handed backhand, one of the best in the world, uh, uh, Rafa Nadal, double-handed backhand, um, uh, uh, Novak Djokovic, double-handed backhand, uh, uh, Serena Williams, double-handed backhand with a single-handed slice. Phenomenal backhands, all these champions. Whereas my backhand, as you saw just there, just went in the bottom of the net. I do not have the great technique on my, on my tennis game, but I, for me, it was about physicality. It was about mental toughness. It was the, the quickness of speed of, of my and high coordination and my, and my feet. Uh, I'm very fast. That's my God-given talent. And um, I grew up being a footballer. I'm talented at football. Pelé was one of my idols growing up. Uh, Muhammad Ali was one of my idols growing up. Uh, Martina Navratilova, uh, Rod Laver, these were my idols kind of growing up. But really, Pelé was a, a man who was not only just a thorough gentleman off the field, but he was a thorough champion on it. He was a perfectionist on it. And to me, that was what kind of uh, drove me. Um, as a young boy, I used to sleep in my bed with my pillow uh, as my football boots. My football boots would be right next to me. Um, as a young boy, I used to polish those football boots every morning when I woke up. I used to sleep with a football in my bed and I used to hug it. Because I always wanted to come out of an underground locker room into a 100,000 stadium at the World Cup Finals with Leander on my back and the whole crowd chanting my name. That was my dream. 
to be a football champion. But sometimes in life, I think you have to pivot. Sometimes in life, including what we're going through right now in 2020, is you have to kind of redirect yourself. And not always do you get to live your passion exactly like how you dream it, but you've got to actually persevere and reinvent yourself to be an Olympic champion in a sport that you're not so talented at. And right now, as you see, I'm going to surf for the title, uh, uh, for the, the bronze medal, I'm sorry. I keep referring to Grand Slam kind of tennis. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm serving for uh, my, my Olympic medal, uh, you know, that is there. And uh, I've got another little, here's my Olympic medal. Here's one of them. Uh, this one is, uh, is that I've got seven of these. This is a participation medal. I've got seven participation medals. But right there, I'm up 30 love now, and I'm looking over at my box. I'm looking over at my mom and my dad, and my dad says, focus. That's all he was saying right through the match. He knew I had worked my whole life for this. He knew that I had given every single thing I had, from polishing his medal to standing on this uh, podium here in Atlanta in Stone Mountain. He knew I was destined for it. Why? Because in 1972, he had a dream that he was able to let his son believe in it. He taught me how to believe in a dream. He taught me how to not just dream big, but he taught me how to achieve those dreams. And I'm so grateful to my mom and my dad. <clears throat> I'm so grateful to every single tennis coach and trainer and, 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 and mentor that I've had. I'm grateful to my Olympic captains and my Davis Cup captains uh, for actually believing in me. My, my box right there uh, is very, very nervous, as you can see. They're sitting out front and they're sitting on the edge of their seats, <laughs> uh, drinking water to kind of uh, parch their, uh, to quench their parched throats. But um, I kind of knew underneath my beak of my hat right there that all I had to do was first serve, first volley, buddy. First serve, first volley. And... Uh, <clears throat> oh, he's gone into the net. Wow, you've done so well to stay in that rally. He had the chance down the line. He's put it into net. So now two points to win the bronze medal. This is it. This is it. Got goosebumps right now. And trust me, it's not very cold in, uh, in India at the moment. Brilliant. It's pretty warm, pretty humid. But I've got goosebumps right here. And you see that in the IND, you see that flag there on the, on the bottom of that screen? That was for one billion people. The pressure that you face playing for one billion people, where if you lose, they'll say, that's what we thought. But if you win, you become their hero. I really thought I had the edge there. I was praying for it. <laughs> yeah, it was close. It was very close. <laughs> God. I got to be honest. Uh, I'm a bit nervous serving right there. And I played this first volley and it just went long. Just gone long. Just, just. And I was wanting to play a quick point. Look at my eyes there. I'm in a zone. I'm oblivious to the samba beat. I'm oblivious to all the Brazilians shouting and screaming for Mel and Jenny. Uh, that's my family right there. Uh, that's Anissa. And uh, she's basically all nervous next to my mom and next to her dad. And uh, Mel and Jenny's, uh, you know, got a, he, he's trying to save another match point. And I knew he was trying to save another match point. So first serve, first volley, buddy. That's all it's about. Keep it simple, silly. That's how you win Olympic medal. There we go. Oh, he got it back. But there it is. There it is, bronze for Leander Pius in 1996. What, what are you thinking when you see that? I, I, I can see a little tear in the eye, Leander. You know, uh, Mel and Jenny is one of my dear friends, and it's hard to beat one of your dear friends when you know that both of you all, this is the only chance you all are probably going to have to covet uh, singles medals in the Olympics. And... Uh, I'm running over to my family right now, but as I put my hands up, most people uh, thought when that last ball went out and I put my hands up uh, to come in the single individual Olympic medal after 44 years, most people thought that I was in jubilation. Most people thought I was celebrating in ecstasy, but I was in a lot of pain just there. Uh, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of years and a lot of hard work um, to cover this medal. And, a lot of those people uh, right there, uh, my stepmom, Juliana, my mom on the, on the left in the white, um, my dad right behind. Um, my family have made me who, who I am. And uh, India has given me an opportunity as an athlete 
to represent our flag and represent our people um, to the best of my ability. And my 30 years that I've just completed playing my career, um, the epitome of my career is this moment. Is You can see the pain and the, and the struggle and the, the effort that I've gone through, which is in my head while I'm walking across the court back to my bags again. But uh, as much as there's a silence, Rory, not every human being gets a chance to to be an Olympic uh, winner, you know. And not every human being gets to represent their flag and their people. But there's something about the Olympic movement that uh, is magical. There's something about showing people, showing every kid on the planet that if I can be Olympic champion, I'm not very tall. I don't have great tennis technique. I didn't even grow up a tennis player. But if I can be an Olympic champion, so can you. It just takes a lot of belief in yourself. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of self-belief. And it takes tremendous hard work. But if you believe in yourself, and if you really put in the hard yards and you do your homework well, you can be a champion in any walk of life, in anything you want to do. And as I tip my hat to the crowd that day, because they were brilliant, they were really phenomenal, um, I uh, got to thank the good Lord up above for the skills that I was blessed with. And I got to thank, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who have made a difference in my life for me to be a champion. But uh, that win was not just for me. That win was not just for my mom and my dad who believed in me or gave me the dream. That win belongs to every kid on this planet who has a dream in their heads and wants to be a champion. That win belongs to over a billion Indians around the world who have given me the honor for representing them. But uh, that day, that night, I sat at the dining table with my dad <laughs> and I had dinner with him. Absolutely. Um, just quickly, before, I mean, we could have talked so long to playing with your idol, Martina Navratilova and everything. But uh, one thing I want to ask, what do you think your legacy to India and to Indian tennis is? And, you know, obviously winning that bronze medal, winning all those grand slams and doubles. What do you, how, how would you kind of like to be remembered in, in the whole kind of Indian sport and tennis? That's a big question. Um, you know, I think that uh, every human being comes to this world with a purpose. And I believe that my purpose was to show people and to show youngsters that um, if you dream big and you have the fearlessness to go after your dreams and you work really hard and you really believe in yourself, that no matter where in the world you come from or no matter what environment you're brought up in, that you can be a champion too. And to India, basically, I grew up to a father that was an Olympic champion. I grew up to a father that gave me a dream. And that's my father's, bronze, my father's medal there, that one. And that's mine right next to it. But really, I think uh, that's the man I got to thank. That's the man who taught me how to brush my teeth, taught me how to shave, he let me go at the age of 12 to pursue my dream. I left home at the age of 12. 12th of May, 1986, I went to tennis academy. And that's the man who, who showed me how, uh, how to be a champion. Well said, great words, Leander. One very, very quick question. You've been at seven Olympic games. Tokyo, it's been postponed a year. Will you go for eight? I don't know. I, uh, I wonder whether the Olympics will happen in Tokyo because we're all living in very uncertain times. Uh, this COVID-19 has been one hell of a global pandemic. And as much as we all live in certain times, the world economy has crashed. The world economy is going to take a while to come back. Um, a lot of athletes have prepared from Rio Olympics to 2020. We're supposed to be at the Olympics in a few weeks from now. But uh, every 100 meter sprinter who's prepared four years for 10 seconds of a race, every athlete who's prepared to go to an Olympics and in 10, 10 days make themselves from zeros to heroes. Every corporate, every person involved in the Olympic movement has done so much 
to prepare for the Japan Olympics in Tokyo. And the Olympic uh, movement, the Olympic uh, Association, the Olympic bodies across the world have done so much to prepare for the Olympics. And I don't know, Rory, whether we will be going to Tokyo in 2021 because we're still waiting for a vaccine to come out to make professional travel and professional sport safe to travel. I don't know if Tokyo 2021 will happen, but I'll tell you this, that with a dream in your heart and with a lot of hard work, if Tokyo Olympics does happen and I do get a chance to be there, once again, I'll get to raise the bar and prove how a young boy from Calcutta can make a difference to his community. Why? Because that's his destiny. Go on, be a champion. Brilliant, Tokyo, you said. 2023, no matter what, be a champion. It's just great words. Great to speak to you, Leander. And I've so enjoyed this chat with you and watching back your bronze at Atlanta 1996. Leander, thank you again so much for joining us on My Great Olympic Moment. God bless you, Rory. And uh, thank you to our producer, Marco, and to all the people behind the scenes here for making this wonderful interaction happen. Um, you all made a young Indian man very happy today. But to all our viewers out there, be the best you can be. I've lost 21 people to COVID. But at the same time, you make a difference in your community. You go out there and be the best you can be. Make a difference. That's what the Olympics stands for. The Olympics stands for goodness, for health, for quality of life. And for me, the Olympics is magical. So, namaste from India. God bless. Thank you, Leander.